Hello and greetings from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm Jay Stephen Morrison. I'm a senior vice president here at CSIS in Washington, D.C., where I direct our Global Health Policy Center. Today's event is, a, is focused on the issuance of a very important major study that came out on February 21st. It's the destruction and devastation, one year of Russia's assault on Ukraine's health system. Uh, this is a remarkable piece of work. I'll say a bit more in a moment about why it is so remarkable. And we have three speakers connected to this effort who will be with us, um, three Ukrainian participants in this effort. Which brings me to the first point why this is remarkable. This study was carried out amidst war during the first year of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Hardly propitious circumstances for carrying forward such an analysis. And it was a, it was a partnership between two Ukrainian institutions, the Media Initiative for Human Rights. We have a representative from there today. The Ukrainian Health Care Center and then other international partners. Physicians for Human Rights will be hearing from their representative in Ukraine and two other institu inter international institutions, Insecurity Insight um, and Eyewitness to Atrocities. So this is an important demonstration of what is possible under very, very adverse circumstances in tackling a topic the deliberate and systematic violent attack in warfare against the health sector um, to be engaging in a systematic study of what is happening while it is, in, while it is happening. I want to offer special thanks not just to those who are here with us today to speak who I'll introduce in a moment, but I also want to offer special thanks to Christian DeVos, who is a lead investigator based out of Physicians for Human Rights in New York City. He was here with us December 13th when we hosted the Ukrainian health minister here at CSIS and he came on camera with us just recently last week for the seventh episode newly released of our video series Ukraine the human price of war. I also want to thank uh, a close friend who's here with us today in the audience Len Rubenstein from Johns Hopkins University Center on Humanitarian Health Len has played an integral role in the production of the, and review of this report as well, and it was kind enough to bring it to our attention. What did this report do that makes it so exceptional? And we'll hear from Uliana uh, in just a moment. First, it pulled together the data, complicated, different formats, different sources of data into a clean and credible evidentiary base. Uh, amid war and it, it came from multiple sources, came in multiple formats, that data had to be cleaned, standardized and integrated. Not a simple task, but it did it and it did it very successfully, the investigators. It provided that, it then formed that into an evidentiary base that can prod those who are responsible for prosecuting these crimes to begin to take action, and we'll talk more about that, whether that's the International Criminal Court, a UN Tribunal, the UN Human Rights Council. This is creating the basis for investigation. It's action-oriented. It this effort is intended not just to illuminate to the world's population what has happened, but to create a tool for further action and prosecution. It's an action agenda. The last thing I'd say is something that we'll hear more from our speakers, which is it creates compelling human stories that are coherent, uh, that we can digest and see, illuminate the magnitude of, of what is happening and, and understand in a closer way what it means to have these attacks happen. It is such an alien thing to most people, what is being recorded, that these stories are terribly, terribly vital in illuminating it for us. Let me just turn now. We're going to hear in, in succession uh, three speakers. I've asked Uliana Poltevets coming in from Kyiv 
to lead off with five minutes of overview of the study. We'll have opportunity to talk in greater depth about this, but we want to set the stage. Uliana is a Ukraine Emergency Response Coordinator inside Ukraine at Physicians for Human Rights. She's one of the authors of the report. Uliana, thank you so much for being with us. Hold for just one second. Our other presenters today are Tatiana Katrychenko. Welcome, Tatiana, for being with us. She is a coordinator of this effort at the Media Initiative for Human Rights, a Ukrainian institution. Great to have you with us. Our third guest today is Anna Olson. Anna, welcome. Anna is a senior combat medic in the Chemical and Biological Defense Unit of a Marine Brigade, the Ukrainian 36th Separate Marine Brigade, and she was based at the Ilyich, Ilyich plant in Mariupol. Uh, she was taken prisoner and held six months in captivity in that period, so we, want, we will hear her story. So we have three remarkable speakers with us this morning. Uh, we're very, very fortunate to be able to have the three of you there. U Uliana is going to head, lead off uh, our, as, as we hear from as we hear from Tatiana and from Anna, we will have the benefit of some translation. They will each speak in Ukrainian. Victor, transla our translator, will help us in giving translation. So bear with us in the audience. This is an opportunity for us to hear from all three and just be patient. Uliana, it's terrific that you could come to us from Kyiv today. Uh, thank you for this report and congratulations on the report. If you could lead us off with a few minutes of overview of the report. Well, thank you, Steve, first of all, for, for having me and thank you to everyone in the audience for coming um, this Monday. Uh, when our coalition of researchers set out to investigate, document and shine a light on violence against healthcare personnel and infrastructure perpetrated uh, during Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Well, uh, we knew that there are attacks in hospitals and medics, but the sheer scale of it was, I think, unlike anything we've seen before. Um, together uh, with our colleagues at Eyewitness to Atrocities uh, in Security Insight, uh, Media Initiative for Human Rights, who are here uh, there with you in, uh, in D.C., uh, the Ukrainian Healthcare Center here in Kiev. Um, we at Physicians for Human Rights published this new report uh, titled Destruction and Devastation, One Year of Russia's Assault on Ukraine uh, Healthcare System uh, that documents how Russia appears to have um, both deliberately and indiscriminately uh, target, um, attacked um, Ukraine's healthcare, healthcare system as part of a broader attack on Ukraine's civilian population and infrastructure. Uh, this report um, is also accompanied by this interactive map that um, users can go online um, uh, to and analyze patterns of violence um, affecting medical facilities, health workers, and infrastructure. So in, in our report, we found in total um, a minimum of 707 uh, violent attacks on hospitals, health workers, um, other medical infrastructure that really devastated Ukraine's health system during the first war, uh, um, during the first year of uh, Russia's full-scale invasion. But this is really just until uh, the end of uh, last year. And as we go on, we document more and more, and you can go on our uh, map that will be regularly updated online. That's nearly one in 10 uh, of Ukraine's hospitals that have been directly damaged from the attacks. There were also 86 attacks on health workers, um, and 62 of them were killed and 52 injured. Many others were uh, threatened, imprisoned, taken hostage, and forced to work under Russian occupation. And I think Tatiana will talk more about this um, as it was documented in detail uh, in our case studies that were um, really described um, in, our, in our report. And of course, Anna will have um, uh, who will recount her own lived experience of this. There's also um, a great impact on health um, of the society. 
bomb by bombing hospitals and torturing medics, Russia is effectively cutting off access to healthcare for millions of adults and children. Um, uh, the IAM International um, my, um, Organization of Migration Survey found that um, one in uh, every three Ukrainian um, of Ukrainians were experiencing a lack of medical ser um, services in Ukraine. Um, so our report really shows that uh, there is reasonable basis to believe that uh, the documented attacks constitute war crimes and uh, comp comprise a course of conduct that could potentially constitute crimes against humanity as well. And it comes at a very uh, uh, right time, you know, just after Vice President Harris's remarks were delivered in Munich um, a couple of days ago when she declared that Russia's violations in Ukraine are, are crimes against humanity. Uh, and uh, we believe that this uh, strongest accusation yet from, from the U.S. Um, was notable among the violations, uh, amongst the violations that she named was an attack on a hospital in Mariupol. Uh, it is probably among the first times that the attacks on health received this high level of attention and demand for accountability among global leaders. And in our report, we lay out a very practical uh, path for prosecutors and at different levels to seek accountability, whether it's, as you said, the International Criminal Court um, or within Ukraine or in the framework of, of universal jurisdiction. And most importantly, um, we call on Russia to seize these attacks and end its aggression. Thank you. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Uliana, thank you. I'm, 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 very, uh, I'm very encouraged that you did make reference to what happened at the Munich Security Conference. It was very clear at the Munich Security Conference that this agenda of accountability uh, for war crimes has, has been elevated significantly and that countries which had been holding back or skeptical were moving in the direction of embracing this. Having our Vice President Kamala Harris make that the centerpiece of her speech was unprecedented and was quite extraordinary. To then have the President Biden cross to Kyiv a few days later and then deliver his very dramatic speech in Poland in which he reaffirmed uh, those positions, also unprecedented. And so I think we are, the release of your report on February 21st, the timing could not have been better in terms of putting forward this evidentiary base at a moment in which global leadership is giving it such a strong boost of attention. Uh, you, I, I think it, that is just an extraordinary opportunity for moving this forward. Say, say something to us before we move on to Tatiana and Anna. Tell us a bit about what was the most difficult challenge in producing this report. Well, I cannot talk for everyone, of course, um, but um, for me personally, of course, it was the, the personal stories that we had to tell in this report uh, through our case studies. Um, it was really difficult to, for me to, you know, to kind of sew them together and to tell them through a very, they're very emotional, but to, to put them on a paper and tell them very, in a very you know, neutral way is, is very, very hard, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we um, move now to hear from uh, Tatiana. Welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we've asked you if you could select some of the most compelling stories coming out of this effort with this focus on case studies, capturing some of the detail of these stories. Um, that, I think, is among the most compelling aspects of this report. So tell us, tell us one of these. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Uh, 
Наша організація підготувала чотири кейси для цього репорту. Our organization put together four cases for this report. Перший кейс це напад на лікарню в Маріуполі, про який говорила Уляна. The first case was about attack and assault on Mariupol Hospital that Uliana mentioned about. Також захоплення лікарні в Херсоні, Херсонській області. Also the hospitals that were occupied and seized in Kherson and Kherson region. Також розстріл швидкої допомоги, яка їхала на допомогу людям, які виїжджали з населеного пункту Кримінна в Донецькій області, і вона була розстріляна. Also the destruction, shooting and destruction of, of an ambulance that was leaving with civilians, patients, patients from Kremina in the Donetsk region. And the fourth case was about uh, capturing, uh, capt uh, capturing um, the medic, military medic. І це важливо говорити про те, що зараз в полоні перебуває кілька десятків військових медиків, як комбатантів, так і не комбатантів. It's important to talk about this because there are more than several dozens of medics in captivity, both combatants and non-combatants. І немає ніякої різниці, чи це є військовослужбовець, чи це є медик, їх всіх брали в полон і утримували в однакових умовах. And they made no difference whether that was a military medic or non-military medic. They were all taken prisoner and they were kept prisoners there. І вони ставали також свідками того воєнних злочинів, про які також згадувалися, про те, що не надавалася медична допомога в великій кількості військовополонених. And they became witnesses in case of war crimes where no medical care whatsoever was given to prisoners of war. І про це важливо говорити, і ця, важ... і ця тема не є дуже... досить е, популярною і досить відомою. Також Російська Федерація не, при... не визнає, що військові медики або просто медики-некомбатанти, май... особливо медики-некомбатанти, мають бути звільнені в першу чергу. And it's important to understand that the Russian Federation does not uh, allocate any importance, does not understand that uh, combat medics, as well as non-combatant medics, first and foremost, should be released first and foremost. І в цьому контексті дуже важливо, що сьогодні з нами є Анна, яка є військовим медиком, яка надавала допомогу в, в Маріуполі, який був оточений, а також була з, вимушена здатися в полон. It's very important that we have Anna with us. She is a uh, combat medic who was uh, taken prisoner in Mariupol and she was forced to surrender as part of that operation in Mariupol. Я би хотіла скоротити свій час для того, щоб передати Анні слово, для того, щоб вона змогла більше розповісти, як, як це сталося і що було в полоні. I'd like to shorten my presentation and give this extra time to Anna so she could tell you more about what she experienced as a, as a prisoner of war. Thank you. Um, that's terrific, Tatiana. Thank you. And we'll come back to you okay. for more because we do want to hear more from you and I, and I have a number of questions, but that's very generous. We'll move over to Anna. Uh, you, were a me you were a medic within the military, in the Marine Brigade. You were taken prisoner. Describe for us your story. My path as a medic and as a military started in 2015. I started out as a medic and as a military personnel uh, in uh, 2015. На той час це вже був другий рік війни в країні, і тому питання йти чи не йти в армію не стояв взагалі. It was the second year of the war in Ukraine, and there was no issue, a question in my mind whether I should join or not. Всі наші лікарі, як військові, так і цивільні, роблять все з початку війни 2014 року для того, щоб вберегти життя як цивільних, так і військовослужбовців. All our doctors, both military and civilian doctors, are doing their utmost best and possible, starting in 2014 with the start of the war, to save lives of both military and civilians. І дивлячись на це із сторони, я дуже хотіла стати частиною цієї великої допомоги в такий важкий час для нашої країни. And looking at it from a side, I realized that I wanted to be part of the effort in such a demanding and hard times for our country. Для нас повномасштабне вторгнення почалося трошки пізніше на території Маріуполя. We saw the full-scale invasion a bit later in Mariupol region. Це десь 23-24 лютого. 
That was around the 23rd, 24th of February. І почалося воно для нас з великих проблем і великих питань. And it started out for us with big problems and big questions. Великі проблеми були в тому, що ми втратили багато військовослужбовців. The problem lied in the fact that we lost a lot of personnel, military personnel. І дуже багато було тяжко поранених. And we had a lot of heavily wounded personnel. На той час ще було можливим евакуювати поранених в Маріуполь. It was still possible at that time to evacuate our wounded personnel to Mariupol. До військового шпиталю, який вже пізніше приєднався до нас на території заводу. To a military hospital that later joined us on the territory of the plant that we're defending. Але багато військовослужбовців і цивільних також, які знаходилися в міських лікарнях в Маріуполі. Були жорстоко вбиті військовослужбовцями Російської Федерації. Коли російські військовослужбовці захоплювали інфраструктури міста для того, щоб вони могли оборонятися там. When the Russian military were seizing the infrastructure of the city so they could use it for defense. На той час точну кількість жертв ми не знали. We did not know about the exact number of casualties at that time. Це все було в той час, як ми намагалися облаштувати позиції на заводі. That was happening at the time when we were reinforcing our defense positions at the plant. І в тих умовах намагалися створити більш-менш стерильні умови для допомоги пораненим. And under the conditions we were we were operating, we were trying to create more or less sterile, clean conditions for our patients, for our wounded. Тому що поранених з кожним днем було все більше і більше. Because we were getting more and more wounded personnel every coming day. Їхні поранення були дуже різноманітні, від легких до важких, до ампутації. Their wounds varied from light wounds to very heavy wounds, including amputations. На той час у нас ще були запаси медикаментів. We had some supplies of medication and medicines at that time. Тому ми могли надавати кваліфіковану допомогу більш швидше і більш ретельніше. Therefore, we were still in a position to provide medical care and medical help quicker, in a quicker and more expedient way. Багато з наших медиків, я б в тому числі, до подій в Маріуполі. Before Mariupol events and defense, a lot of medics like me. Ми не мали бойового випадку. Опиту. We had no combat experience. Тому що ми були на другій лінії, як допомога в підвозі або завозі якихось медикаментів або інших необхідних речей. Because we were positioned and located on the second line, and we were basically bringing more supplies, medication and medicine supplies. Тому вже на заводі ми почали працювати як в одному симбіозі. So therefore our symbiotic operation started at the plant as one. І допомагати одне одному, судячи з того опиту, який ми мали ще до служби в армії або вже під час неї. And we started actually helping each other in all possible ways using the experience that we gained before we joined the army and during the service in the army. На момент... Взяття в полон моєї бригади. В нас було десь більше 980 поранених військовослужбовців. Які на даний час також ще знаходяться в полоні. Які на даний час також ще знаходяться в полоні. Їх відправляли в так звані лікарні на тимчасово окупованих територіях. They were sent to so-called hospitals on temporarily occupied Ukrainian territories. Але судячи з розмов, належної медичної допомоги їм не надавали. But judging by the conversations we heard, there was no proper health care given to them. Яскравим прикладом відсутності медичного забезпечення і медичного лікування в полоні. 
a very vivid and obvious example of the absence and lack of medical care and treatment uh, while in captivity. Є стан здоров'я військовослужбовців, які повертаються з полону. Is a state of health of those prisoners of war coming back from the captivity. Вони мають багато хронічних і гострих захворювань. They suffer from a lot of chronic and acute conditions and, and disease. And, and disease. Багато ушкоджень, які вже є застарілими, як переломи, синці або побиття. And they have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, bones broken, uh, traces of beating and, uh, and uh, black spots on their bodies because of the beating. May I just ask you, um, so you're in this terrible situation. Um, was there any access to these to the wounded population by groups like the International Committee of the Red Cross? Ніякого доступу до представників Червоного Христа ми не мали і на всі наші запити і прохання зв'язатися з ними. No, we did not have any access to ICRC whatsoever, and every request that we extended to meet with them was met with a very brutal response from the Russian soldiers. І ті військовослужбовці цивільні, які потребували медичної допомоги в полоні, її не отримували, а отримували лише катування та побиття. And those POWs, POWs who actually needed medical care badly were getting none of it, only getting more beating and brutality. So tell me, tell us a bit about your own personal experience. You were, you were detained for six months, is that correct? Yes. What was, describe that. Чесно, це була гра на виживання. To be honest, that was a game of survival. Я зараз кажу не про поодинокі випадки фізичного, сексуального насилля або тортур. And I'm not talking here about one-off cases of physical, sexual violence or torture. Я кажу про систематичне грубе порушення прав людей і прав як військових, так і цивільних. I'm talking about a systemic and systematic brutal violation of human rights both of POWs and civilians. Тому що для них ми були вороги, які прийшли на їх землю, а не навпаки. Because the way they viewed us was we were enemies who came to their land, not in not vice versa. Вони не розуміли, за що ми боремося і чому ми є настільки патріотичними. They did not understand what we were fighting for and what made us so patriotic. І також для більш мотивованих військовослужбовців, які були взяті в полон, вони вигадували більш жорстокіші тортури. For those prisoners of war, for those soldiers who were very motivated pro-Ukrainian, they managed to come up with more brutal uh, and more brutal uh, tortures. Саме легке, як ми казали, було повне знеструмлення електрошоку на твоєму тілі. The easiest or the lightest one uh, that we considered to be the lightest one was the full uh, uh, the, 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 the lightest uh, version of torture that we were given was a full-blown electricity current going through our bodies until full discharge of Let the me, battery. Uh, I, this is a fascinating story. So two quick questions, and then let's let's broaden back to hear from our other speakers. Uh, one is, what is the top line message you want to convey from your experience to an American audience? Саме головне, що я б хотіла сказати американській аудиторії, це те, що Росія є ворогом, якого потрібно 
лише спільними зусиллями перемогти, тому що такій країні немає місця в цивілізованому світі. My top message to the American audience would be this. Russia is an enemy that has to be defeated through joint common efforts because a country like this has no place in a civilized world. And just on a personal note, how did you survive and why were you released? Мені здається, мені пощастило. I think I was just lucky. Тому що, ну, вони не хочуть міняти медиків, як військових, так і цивільних, обґрунтовуючи це тим, що ми повернемося до роботи і будемо рятувати наших військовослужбовців. They do not want to swap medics, both military and civilian ones, because they say that we will get back into the line of duty and will continue saving lives. І мені допомогло вижити в полоні те, що я знала, що наша країна, Україна, не буде забувати і ніколи не покине своїх людей. What helped me survive in captivity was the understanding, the awareness that our country would never leave us behind, would never forget about us. Thank you. That's a very moving personal story and very illuminating. Thank you for sharing that. Um, let's turn back and hear a bit more from, uh, from Tetiana and, and Uliana. Um, this report comes, as we talked about earlier, it comes at a moment in the war when the war is changing and people are deliberating what next. It comes at a moment when international concern with these issues is at a height, a very high place. Um, U.S. policymakers have said that they are interested at a high level in pushing this agenda forward. Uliana, what should happen next in your view? What should be, what should be the types of measures taken to carry forward this agenda? We have this evidence that you've collected. Others are collecting evidence what is what is your what is the what is what is your own personal and the position of physicians for human rights in terms of what needs to happen next well first of all um, we've collected this evidence and it warrants of it warrants further investigation by prosecutorial authorities at all levels as we said both in Ukraine and um, at international level um, by third parties and by third countries. Um, because as we understand, most of the uh, most of the cases will be tried uh, here in Ukraine. Um, and we, we at Positions for Human Rights and with our partners, we're trying to do a lot of advocacy here on the ground and also uh, internationally with uh, diplomatic uh, missions uh, with the UN and with other bodies uh, to um, to hand up, to hand over this uh, this evidence, uh, there's uh, there are different institutions, there are different bodies that uh, can uh, do a lot uh, actually with this evidence. Uh, so um, there, there's been a lot of imp impunity to this date uh, uh, based uh, you know on, on previous conflicts, and we just don't want to see this um, with uh, with Ukraine. Uh, in previous conflicts in uh, in Syria, we've seen this. Um, we've seen this in Chechnya. We've seen this in Georgia. So we don't want to to have this happening here um, until there's a meaningful accountability and perpetrators are, are held to account. Uh, attacks on health will will continue uh, unabated around the globe. Um, so the global community has now an obligation and an opportunity to, to defend the international laws that they've established uh, to protect healthcare in times of war. Uh, so on our part, we'll continue um, our advocacy with the bodies, for example, the Commission on Inquiry uh, that is very active and that has already, uh, I mean, the United Nations, uh, the Human Rights Council, uh, that has already taken into account um, some of our um, some of our submissions in, in the in the reports, uh, in uh, um, in the reports previously, so we hope that um, in the future that there will also be 
um, more attention to uh, Texan health. These are these uh, this type of accumulation of evidence and pressure for prosecution. It always runs up against in wartime some some difficult barriers. If you don't have a defeated enemy, it that becomes a problem. If you uh, if if you have negotiations begin over some sort of settlement, that can become a problem as well. Um, how Tatiana, maybe you can speak to this. And then Uliana, how do you deal with these barriers? How do you keep momentum moving forward in collecting and assembling this type of data when we know that Russia is not likely to be defeated in the near term? And when we know that people will argue that this might be problematic for any negotiations? Juliana, feel free to weigh in if you wish. Um, sure. Well, I don't know if Tatiana wants Tatiana, to. Tatiana, do you want to speak first? Uh, first, we do not even consider an option that there will be no victory. Але наша організація одразу після звільнення певних територій намагається зайти на ці території, аби зафіксувати, задокументувати воєнні злочини, зокрема і напади на заклади охорони здоров'я. As an organization, what we do as soon as territories get liberated, we try to move in right away and to document, to record all the crimes that were committed, including war crimes and attacks against the medical facilities. І насправді історії, які ми можемо побачити там в полі, їх набагато більше, ніж є в цьому репорті. In fact, stories that we experienced in the field are much more numerous than the one that recorded in the report. Є історії про те, як фельдшери в населеному пункті організовували пункти надання медичної допомоги, тому що іншого варіанту у себе вдома, тому що іншого варіанту не було. There were cases that we saw when nurses and even doctors organized health care at their home, facilities at their home, own home, because there was no other option to help people. Because the Russian military did not allow people to leave certain communities, uh, um, or some communities, uh, people who had even serious even those people who had serious problems, issues with their health. Наприклад, відомий нам відома історія чоловіка, який мав цукровий діабет, і йому було потрібно додаткові додаткові ліки, але не виїхати, не отримати їх він не міг, і він помер від гонгрени. We know a of a confirmed case when a, an individual with diabetes suffering uh, with diabetes was not allowed to leave his community because he needed to get extra and additional medication and treatment. He was not allowed to leave and he died because of gangrene. І але водночас, окрім того, що ми заходимо на звільнені території, ми також багато спілкуємося з окупованими територіями. In addition to us entering the liberated territories right away, we also talk and communicate with the occupied areas. Зі свідками цих подій, а також з людьми, які різними можуть говорити. We talk about we talk with witnesses as well as with people who are free to talk. Ми у нас є такий досвід, оскільки Донецька і Луганська область були окуповані з 2014 року і ми також спілкувалися з людьми. We have the experience of that kind because Donetsk and Luhansk regions have been under occupation from 2014 and yet we still spoke to people living on those territories. Також ми зустрічаємося зі свідками, які виїжджають з окупованих територій. We also meet with witness, witnesses who leave the occupied territories. Тому, якщо є бажання, а у нас є таке бажання, ми можемо зібрати необхідні докази і свідчення. Therefore, if there is a wish, and we do have a lot of that, there is always a possibility and opportunity to collect all a lot of evidences from evidence from witnesses. So the answer there is, you you cannot be deterred by these by these obstacles. Just Keep moving full steam ahead. Ваш відповідь, що ці ці бар'єри вас не зупиняють, просто повним походом вперед. Так. 
That's exactly. exactly. Uliana, your thoughts? Yes, I agree. And uh, just to, to the first uh, uh, thought that Titana said that uh, we're very much hoping for uh, uh, the victory, you know, and this war hasn't started last year. It started in 2014. Um, and, you know, I just, um, we have a small section in our report uh, analyzing past conflicts. Among these past conflicts, we're also referring to attacks on health um, in the occupied territories of Ukraine prior to 2022. Uh, our report does not analyze those, but we would very much hope that um, sometimes we would be able to uh, also um, analyze those attacks in more detail because there are, there are so much uh, there is so much uh, more there than um, than uh, than there have have been uh, of course there, there there are recorded attacks but uh, I, I would I would think so that we would need to analyze the, this in more in more detail and I've just seen a, a report uh, today that. Um, there was a survey in Ukraine uh, that uh, in case of a, a tactical nuclear attack, Ukrainians would, uh, 86 Ukraine, Ukrainians would like to keep on fighting, uh, you know, so that's, uh, I think that's a clear answer to, to, your, <laughs> to your question about uh, negotiations with, with Russians. Um, thank you. Um, I'm assuming that with this powerful uh, product that you have generated and with your own commitments that uh, you're going to be making the rounds of governments and international groups and others uh, here, in, here in the United States and Canada, in Europe, in New York, at the UN and elsewhere. Um, what, is the, what is the ask when you are here in Washington, D.C.? When you're talking to Congress or you're talking to the administration, what is the what is the ask that you will be making? Ми розуміємо, що важливо, ну, по-перше, важлива підтримка для України. First and foremost, we understand how important support for Ukraine is. І що увага не має ставати меншою. And that their attention should not diminish. Тому що ця битва не є тільки за Україну, це є битва за демократію. Because this is not just a battle for Ukraine, it's a battle for democracy. Також ми мож ми будемо говорити про те, що велика кількість цивільних громадян і військовослужбовців знаходяться зараз на території Російської Федерації, на окупованій території, в полоні і в заручниках. We are going to also speak about the fact that there are a lot of civilians being held both on the occupied territories of Ukraine and on the Russian Federation's territory, both as prisoners and, and hostages. Цивільних громадян взагалі Російська Федерація не має права затримуватися це є воєнним злочином. The Russian Federation has no right to detain civilians. This is a war crime. Військовослужбовців можна затримувати, оскільки це війна, але не можна над ними знущатися, як про що говорила Анна. POWs may, can be detained because it's a war, but, as Anna mentioned, they should not, should, no torture uh, and mistreatment should, have, should be applied to them. І на нас, для нас дуже важливе було ваше питання про Червоний Хрест, це про те, що немає доступу взагалі. And it was a very important question that you posed about the, the Red Cross, the ICRC, because there's no access for IC, of ICRC to our prisoners whatsoever. Тобто тисячі людей знаходяться в такої в такій зоні небезпеки і в зоні не 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 зрозуміло якої ситуації. Thousands of people, thousands of individuals are in the danger zone, are in the zone of uncertainty and situ the situation that is totally unclear. Якщо ми не можемо звільнити громадян України, то ми маємо полегшити і ці умови їх утримання і маємо утримати цей доступ. If we can't release all the Ukrainian citizens from captivity, then we should make sure that the conditions of their captivity and treatment are easier or better and we should ensure this access to them до поранених військовослужбовців і до цивільних, які також зазнають катувань. I mean to wounded POWs as well as the civilians who experience and are subjected to torture. Anna, you've listened to this. You've lived through this. 
What are your, do you have anything to add to what Tatiana and Uliana have said about yep. speaking to uh, a policy audience, speaking to powers here in the United States, what should they do? Я повністю згодна з дівчатами. I fully agree with the ladies. Єдине, що я хочу додати і, ну, моє послання тут, як військовослужбовця. The only thing I would like to add to that, and that would be my message as a military personnel here. Світова спільнота має розуміти, що Російська Федерація. The world community must understand that the Russian Federation не дотримується ніяких людських поглядів does not adhere to any human views та повне недотримання Женевської конвенції and total disregard and they have a total disregard for the Geneva Convention тому я хочу, щоб світова спільнота побачила і почула те, що відбувається зараз в Україні, ця війна не закінчилася ще, вона продовжується. І кожного дня тисячі українців, які боронять Україну, або ті, хто допомагають як волонтери, або просто цивільні люди. And I would like to say to the world, and I want them to see, I want them to hear that the war in Ukraine is not over. It's ongoing now. And we have thousands and thousands of Ukrainians who are defending Ukraine, both in the armed forces and the civilians. Вони бояться, але вони роблять. І нам Україна потребує цієї допомоги від світової спільноти, щоб ми разом могли побороти країну агресора і щоб вона більше ніколи не загрожув не загрожувала як Україні, так і всьому світу. These individuals, Ukrainians, both the military and the civilians, they are afraid, but they keep going, they keep defending, and they keep, they keep fighting. And therefore, we need support from the world, our utmost possible support from the world, so together we could defeat them, defeat the Russian Federation, so that we, they would never threaten uh, either Ukraine or the world at large. Thank you. You know, you've raised a number of issues I just want to offer a few comments. Um, it's true that um, Americans' support for, for Ukraine has been, in this first year, pretty unified and pretty remarkable. But it's not guaranteed. And there's some of the, some of the recent survey work, opinion work in the United States, shows that we are fragmenting. Our opinion is fragmenting here. Do you want to translate for the, uh, do they understand? That we are in a, diff we're in a, we in the United States face our own problems of, of maintaining unity and resolve with respect to Ukraine. And one of the factors that has kept Americans United is the awareness of the atrocities being committed. And in that sense, what you are doing is very important in delivering that and bringing that forward to an American audience. The more that, the more that Americans are reminded of this reality, the greater the possibility of sustaining this remarkable level of U.S. leadership in support of Ukraine. Um, one thing, I, just a personal note to Anna. Um, I have a nephew who just spent several months in Ukraine training medics. He's a professional, former professional military medic. And so I've spent a lot of time talking to him about the young medics being trained at a very high rate within Ukraine and the circumstances in which they serve. We oftentimes forget about medics uh, and, uh, in, this, in these conflicts. 
Um, we're getting towards the um, towards the end of our hour right now, um, and we've covered a lot of ground, um, and you've told us a lot about what is in the report. You've told us about what you want, what the messages are that you would like to bring uh, to to your audience. Um, tell us. I want to ask each of you to think about uh, what lies ahead in this coming year. Because here in America and elsewhere, people are asking them, the que asking them a very difficult question. W where is this war going? What can we expect in this next period? And how to keep, how to keep hope alive in this next period? So um, Uliana, maybe just each of you could give a short answer to that question, and then we could close. Uliana, thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, first of all, thank you, and um, thank you to all to, to other, the American people for the ongoing support. Um, and um, I started my speech with saying that uh, we we drafted this report, and we were kind of shocked with the scale of the attacks. We knew they were happening, but we were shocked about, about the scale of it. But what we also found throughout the, the whole process, um, we were also very uh, humbled by the resilience of, of, the, of our healthcare system, of, of the doctors, of, of the medics, of everyone who makes this possible here. And it's very evident um, throughout the case studies and in the database, every case study uh, you read, you see this, uh, there's this hospital that was bombed, uh, it's destroyed, but you know, there's this small uh, mobile clinic that was installed after this, or the hospital was rebuilt, it was reconstructed right after that, and it's now up and running. Or there's this medic who was, um, he was uh, held captive, but now he's freed and um, he's trying to to live. He's trying to move on. Um, and uh, yeah, th this is complicated, but it is also a story. It's also a story of resilience. And I think this is to answer your question. This is how you find hope uh, for uh, for the next year. Uh, this is how you launch an offensive. A counteroffensive. This is how you find hope um, to continue and to go on. Um, this is how we live here. How we survive. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Juliana. That's very eloquent. Anna, over to you. <coughs> what gives you hope? Честно, надію дають наші люди. To be perfect, our people. Те, які вони сильні і не зламні. To be perfectly honest, our people, their, in their strength and unbreakability. This war is bloody and difficult. We're losing families, relatives, friends. But we keep standing. And exactly, and exactly, it's exactly the people who help our armed forces and the armed forces themselves. Що не зважаючи на все, що зараз відбувається, ми переможемо. Give us hope that regardless of anything that's happening now, we're going to win. Thank you. Tatiana, you have the last word today. Ми б хотіли в цьому році, чого ми чекаємо від цього року, ми б хотіли в цьому році перемогти. What we are expecting of this year is we would like to see victory this year. Але ми розуміємо, що це дуже важка, це важке питання. But we are also aware that this is a difficult issue. І без цієї підтримки американського народу, американського уряду нам буде важко. And it is going to be difficult for us without the support of the American people, of the American government. Але чим швидше переможе Україна, тим швидше світ зможе налагодити знову but the sooner Ukraine wins, the sooner the world will be able to rearrange the, its international order. 
без Російської Федерації. Without the Russian Federation. А, але в цьому році ми маємо також працювати дуже наполегливо, як і в минулому році, збираючи докази, документуючи всі факти порушень, для того, щоб ми мали цілий комплекс доказів того, що, які звірства робила Російська Федерація на території України. But we should continue working this year as steadfastly and as expediently and hard as we did last year, gathering, for the fact, gathering facts of violations and crimes and building a body, a comprehensive body of evidence about the violence and crimes committed by the Russian Federation on the occupied territories of Ukraine. Ми як громадський сектор і як я думаю, уряд ми маємо роз... і розуміти, ми маємо розуміти, що ми маємо мати сильну позицію. The civil society of Ukraine and the government of Ukraine should be aware, should understand that we should come from a very strong position. Thank you. This has been um, rich, powerful, very moving, very inspiring. Um, I want to offer special thanks to and uh, thanks to one of my colleagues, uh, McLean Spear, who pulled this all together in record speed. I know that your plans came together very suddenly in the last few days, and I'm very pleased that we could pull everything together as we have, and McLean deserves enormous credit for having done all of that. Our production team here, Dinesh, Dwayne, G, uh, pulled together uh, also very rapidly to make this happen. Victor, you were kind enough to jump in and do a great job in the translation. Uliana, thank you for coming in from a distance uh, late in the day to be with us. And uh, Tatiana, Anna, thank you so much for being with us. It's a real honor to have all of you here with us in person or remotely. And congratulations on what, what is really a remarkable and very important piece of work that's added significantly to the debate around what is happening and what we need to do into the future. So thank you.